Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno, proud to help introduce a new generation of adventurers to the diverse experiences that our state has to offer. Information at lrlv.com or jlrreno.com. Nevada, a landscape as diverse as it is epic. Where wide open nature and wild adventure call to the curious and the brave alike. It's actually rare and you can count yourself pretty lucky if you actually see the desert bighorn sheep on the refuge. I visit the largest bighorn sheep sanctuary of the contiguous United States. Is it safe? Absolutely safe. Got a roll cage, nice seats. We've added some harnesses and everything on it. You always wear a helmet and goggles. I'm in for a day of sun, sand and fun at the Sand Mountain Recreation Area. The fact is, is that there's always been a very strong poet, poetic tradition worldwide in this kind of lifestyle. I gather with 5,000 other people for a day of poetry in Elko. Yeah! What a rush! I'm John Byrne. I have a passion for the outdoors. Today we're in the Valley of Fire and I'm on a mission to show you the one-of-a-kind history, science, nature, and adventure you find when you step outside. This is Outdoor Nevada. Today I'm at the Desert National Wildlife Refuge, a huge, beautiful place with lots to explore. But before I start doing all that, I'm gonna go inside and talk to the refuge manager, Amy Sprunger. She's gonna tell us what's what. The largest refuge of the lower 48, the Desert National Wildlife Refuge spreads over 1.6 million acres of land and encompasses six mountain ranges. Amy, how are you? Hi, John, nice to see you. This is Amy Sprunger. She is the refuge manager here. Amy has been with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for the last 25 years, 15 of those as the refuge manager. Now, it's not a state park, it's not a national park, it's a refuge. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? So, our primary mission is for wildlife here and the preservation of habitat for wildlife. And, um, you know, national parks have a different mission. You know, they um, emphasize historic places and they welcome a lot more people, obviously, typically, than, than a refuge will. But we are specified through legislation for wildlife. That's our mission is wildlife first. The Desert Wildlife Refuge harbors the largest population of bighorn sheep in the state of Nevada. And yet, it's very difficult to spot one. It's actually rare and you can count yourself pretty lucky if you actually see the desert bighorn sheep on the refuge, of course, given its size. Um, but we have between seven and 800 sheep across the entire refuge, but they're very well adapted to the environment. So they blend in, it's very difficult to see them. But here at Corn Creek, it's more typical to see uh, jackrabbits, cottontails, roadrunners, lizards, maybe a snake or two. We do get the migratory birds that come through and we're pretty well known here in the Las Vegas area as a popular birding site. The refuge is also home for 320 bird species, predominantly black-throated sparrows and ash-throated flycatchers. The building is beautiful. It's new, yeah? Yeah. We just moved in in December of 2013. It was actually certified LEED Platinum, which means it's very green and energy efficient. Um, and uh, it, we're very proud. We've actually won some national awards because of it. It's a great space. You show me around a little bit? You bet. Let's go. All right. At the Visitor Center, guests can explore wildlife and history exhibits, visit the bookstore, and watch a movie about the area. On average, 40,000 people come to the refuge every year. So this is a mural that the picture is actually taken on the refuge, but it represents the species of animals that also can be found on the refuge. We call the exhibit I Spy. It's kind of a fun game that people can look and try to find them. There are 28 species represented, and uh, even when you know where to look, sometimes it's, it's fun and difficult to find them. I spy several rattlesnakes, so yeah. let's just keep going this okay. way. <laughs> yeah, if there's one thing this outdoor host is afraid of, it's snakes. What's in this room? 
So this exhibit area spans time. We begin with Nuwuvi, who have been here since the beginning of time. Nuwuvi more likely is known as the Southern Paiute, but then the transition of time moves to history prior to the refuge being established here, which is the ranching period, and then it moves into the establishment of the National Wildlife Refuge here. Managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the refuge was established in 1936 to provide a safe haven for the desert bighorn sheep. Well, this is a nifty display here. Tell me about mm -hmm. it. So this is what we want visitors to see when they first come in, because this is the representation of the Desert National Wildlife Refuge. You have the sheep, the desert bighorn sheep, which is what we were established for. You have the mountains and the geology that's represented, and it's all sculptured. And then the, um, and then the water, the spring, you know, is life-giving, not only to the wildlife, but of course to humans. But uh, we have a number of springs across the refuge as well. You're doing great work here. You must be very proud of the building, of the refuge, of the work you're doing. I am. As I mentioned, I've been here 15 years. I've been with the Fish and Wildlife Service for over 25 years. And um, it's truly a passion, and it's a great position to have. Keep up the good work. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having you're me welcome. in today. Really. I'm glad you could visit. And um, don't forget to hit the bookstore on your way out. I'm going to do that right now. All right. Thanks, Amy. The Desert National Wildlife Refuge also offers opportunities for hiking, mountain biking, backpacking, and really connecting with nature. 1.6 million acres of solitude and beauty right on the outskirts of Las Vegas. Just one more thing to check out when you're exploring outdoor Nevada. At the end of the last ice age, the earth deposited a lot of sand just outside of Fallon. I'm talking about 600 feet high. And what do the people in Nevada do about this? They ride it. Twenty-five miles east of Fallon lies one of the most popular off-road playgrounds in Nevada. Sand Mountain Recreation Area covers 4,700 acres of high desert, adrenaline, and a whole lot of fun. John, nice seeing you, buddy. How are you? Great. A little chilly. A little chilly, but this is a sport you do year-round, just about. Absolutely. Off-road enthusiast John Crowley turned his passion into business. He owns Crowley Off-Road and guides UTV adventures. Hey, how'd you get into this? Back in the uh, 80s, my wife brought me out here and uh, took me for my first uh, ATV ride with some friends out here at Sand Mountain. Uh, tell me about this area. Well, it's a uh, sand dune, obviously. Uh, it's about 5,000 acres of uh, sand. Not all of it open for off-roading, but it's a, it's a federally designated recreation area specifically for off-roaders. This two-mile-long dune has a lengthy history. It began forming over 9,000 years ago when Lake Lahontan dried up at the end of the Pleistocene age. Over the years, the constant winds and receding waters have shaped it. Now, it's 600 feet high. What does that feel like going up there? Um, well, going up, you're going kind of slow because gravity and the steep sand uh, slows you down. But coming down, you can get going really fast, and it's quite a thrill. What do you like most about it? I like the freeform nature of uh, the dunes. There's, there's no road or, or trail that you have to take. You can decide where you want to go and make you know, your own course out there that uh, is different than it, somebody else's. Do you ever go at night? Absolutely. It's, uh, it's fun at night. you got to kind of slow down a little bit, but I've got some extra lights on this thing uh, to help you see a little bit better at night, and uh, it, it's a different experience. What's the worst thing that's ever happened to you out here? Um, breaking down in my sand rail uh, about uh, 20 feet from the top of the backside, and, and it took me about 13 hours to get to the back, <laughs> get back to camp here. Didn't stop you though. Nope. Still love it. John has the right toy for this terrain. I hope today goes better than his little mishap. Tell me about your vehicle. So this is a Polaris Razor XP Turbo, Polaris's latest and greatest uh, UTV, sport UTV built to go fast, soak up rough terrain, and have fun in a variety of uh, different terrain out there. Is it safe? Absolutely safe. It's got a roll cage, nice seats. We've added some harnesses and everything on it. You always wear a helmet and goggles. This UTV also has a GPS system dialed in. The vehicle is ready for action, and so am I.
one of the most fascinating features of Sand Mountain is its singing. And just by riding the dunes, I can almost hear the humming sound. This rare phenomenon occurs when the fine grains of sand rub against each other. There's no doubt that coming out here and riding these UTVs is an absolute thrill ride. I mean, it is giddy fun, but if you're gonna do this, remember that these sands can sometimes shift. So wear a helmet and have a little guidance. Safety first. That's how we roll out here on Outdoor Nevada. Today I'm in Elko, Nevada, just outside the convention center with about 5,000 other people to see 50 poets and performers here at the 32nd National Cowboy Poetry Gathering. And you, my friend, have a front row seat. Hats, chaps, cowboy boots, and a way of life. At first glance, cowboys and poetry might not go hand in hand. But what more could inspire art than the simple life at the ranch? Long days tending the cattle, longer nights by the campfire, and cowboys filled with tales, folk songs, and of course, poetry. Well, it was a cold, rainy day on the dark Kansas plains. My fingers growing numb as I grabbed for the reins. When I put foot to syrup, he snorted it blue. As I swung in the saddle, right away I knew that I'd ride this old horse until his days were through. Every January for the past 32 years, the campfire gives way to center stage at the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering, where cowboys open their souls to an audience of 5,000 people. On one side, the sun is rising. Just ahead there sets the moon. Shadows high trot there beside you, elongated, keeping pace, reassuring you ain't hobbled by restrictive time or space. Out in front, the boss is posted to the same beat as his song, and the realization hits you. You're right where you belong. This is Waddy Mitchell. He's not only a local boy here in Elko, but he also helped establish this gathering. Waddy, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Well, thank you guys for taking the time to get up here to see some of the fun. You ate your breakfast by the Coleman, then hurried round to beat the sun. Born and raised in Northern Nevada, Wadi helped organize the first cowboy poetry gathering back in 1985. Today, he shares the stage with 48 other artists from the United States and Canada. During their pay, they'll choke in crazy traffic jams, fight for seats on bus or train. It's a wonder that this ritual doesn't drive them all insane. We too, I guess, commute to work as the job at hand dictates, but we commune why we're commuting. What a difference that makes. This might be my new best friend, I'm telling you. What was it like when you first helped establish this? I had never been to a festival, so I wouldn't know what a successful festival was. What I was hoping is that it was gonna get a bunch of my cowpuncher friends in town. We was gonna have a big party. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out to, that it was a big party, but a big party like we hadn't imagined. When you look out at your audience and you see this sea of faces, what do you see? What are you looking at? I see one of the few places you see nothing but friends. If I could pick up this audience and take it with me on my other 200 shows a year, I would be tickled death because you can't do anything wrong in front of this crowd because they are so with you. They want you to succeed. They want to drink in the whole atmosphere. The, the, they want to drink in the attitude. They want to drink in the, the good feelings that everybody's exuding. And that's why on Sunday morning when they're all going home, it's all going around like we just come out of a tour of duty and hug each other and just, you know, look forward to the next time. It's a drastic situation. He An essential part of the gathering, Wadi is also no stranger to outdoor Nevada. 
He was part of the original series back in the 90s when we first came across his talent. Good. He said, God, if you help me now, I'll quit my sinful ways. I'll do the things you'd have me do. I'll work hard all my days. I'll quit the booze and cigarettes. I'll help my loving wife. I'll spend time with my children. I'll turn around my life. I'll work to help the needy. I promise to repent. Just then a tree limb caught his coat and stopped his fast descent. While hanging from the tree that grew out on that rocky shelf, he looked skyward saying, never mind, I handled it myself. At the end of the day, why do you do it? Because I love it. And I love the other people that do it. So this is like a bowling team. Uh, we don't care who wins. We all just come out here to bowl. Whether the poetry comes as a song, a rhyme, or heartfelt spoken words, artists find here an opportunity to celebrate the West and its traditions. This is Doris Daly, and she has been to a lot of these gatherings, and she knows a lot about what's going on around here. Doris, so nice to see you today. Very nice to be seen. You're how, about how many of these have you been to? I think I've been to 10 or 11 in the last uh, 16 years or so. Born a Western writer, Doris has been nominated twice as the top female cowboy poet in North America. Well, I've been doing poetry since I was eight years old in third grade, and I lived in the East for a time, moved back to Alberta, my home province, moved back to ranching country, and went to my very first cowboy poetry gathering in 90 or 91, and I found my tribe of people, people who loved words, loved rhymes, loved the West. What people should know about this, if they've never been, is that this isn't people dressing up in costumes. This is the real deal. We are all real deal people. We're ranching people, um, ranch hands, ranchers' daughters, farm wives, and, and we bring our own stories from where we live. This is Doris's 12th performance at the gathering. And what do you hope that the audience takes from, from your performance today? You know, I don't think people should overthink what, what cowboy poetry is all about. I think they should allow their imaginations to be freed up and, and maybe they're going to go home with a memory of, of their kitchen party back on the plains of North Dakota or maybe a poem they memorized at their grandpa's knee. Um, a tear or a laugh, uh, let the poetry take you to some cosmic place. Shania has a perfume you can get it on CD. Light and luscious florals with a hint of fleur-de-lis. A musky blend of blossoms with a whiff of clover honey. In case her up goes down, she'll still enjoy the smell of money. <laughs> Over the years, the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering became more than a festival. It's a place to reunite with friends and fellow lovers of the cowboy way of life. It's music and poetry. John, how many times have you come to this cowboy gathering? Oh, goodness, it's been probably 23, 24 times we've been here. Why do you come? Um, it's, there's many reasons. It's, it's um, number one, it's of course for the, the poetry and the music. It's an incredible entertainers and it's a lot of fun. But uh, it's also kind of a, a reunion where I get to catch up with some of those performers and entertainers. Um, but also I get to see uh, a lot of people that are in the same industry that I am in the ranching industry that all come for this as well. Integrity is obsolete. Overkill is now the craze. One can't even trust the weatherman on the local news these days. You ask what is the problem? Well, I'd say the main detractor is a careless, irresponsible use of that hateful windshield factor. <laughs> see, the factor was invented by someone who supposed we should know the rate of freezing when bare skin is exposed. This should not concern us, and I'll explain the reason why. It's because nudists in the winter are in fairly short supply. <laughs> what do people need to know about this event? The Cowboy Poetry Gathering is truly one of the most authentically wonderful events that we hold in Nevada, or I think is held throughout the Western United States. It's a wonderful combination of these truly authentic ranchers and cowboys and how they express their lives through the poetry and the music of the area. But then it's also a chance for those of us who don't get to live that life to really take on this persona of the rancher and this really simple yet romantic notion that we have of the American West. So not only do we get to see this wonderful entertainment and this wonderful artistry, but we kind of get to play a character ourselves 
and get into this whole Western theme. So that's what makes this so rich and wonderful. Alone ain't just an empty feel from no one else around. It can be a stretch of prairie grass that covers miles of ground. When you look across the prairie at horizons far and unknown, you're looking straight at country somewhere beyond alone. This is an opportunity to get back to, to your original roots. The, uh, uh, you know, this all kind of comes from the heart. And at the end of the day, if you spend two or three days listening to all the various performers, the poetry, the, uh, the humor, uh, the sadness of the tales, uh, it, it makes you want to go back to earlier days and, and bring you back to your roots. Organized by the Western Folk Life Center, the gathering is a stamp of Nevada's culture. You can't come to the gathering here in Elko without hearing the words, how can it? That name is synonymous with this whole event, and I just happen to have him right here. How nice to see you. Hey, John. Hal started this festival with Wadi. He's a legend around these parts who helped marry cowboys in poetry. So what were you thinking all those years ago when this first was born? Oh, you know, going to college, I, I suffered through a lot of poetry classes, and I, <laughs> And, and uh, poetry was sort of like a double-edged sword. Uh, I read stuff and it just moved me. I just thought, oh my gosh, this is the essence of life. And I came out and I met cowboys that recited these old poems or wrote new poems and they had soul and they had, what they were listening to was the sound of the earth and it came out in their poetry and I just said, you know, we have to share this with the world. It's just, we have to do that. How did cowboys and poetry intersect? The perception was that cowboys were inarticulate, they were laconic, they didn't say much, yes ma'am, no ma'am. But the fact is, is that there's always been a very strong poet, poetic tradition worldwide in this kind of lifestyle. We've brought cowboys from Mongolia, we brought cow gauchos from South America. They walk in the room and all of a sudden, the, ca the American cowboys and the Mongolians recognize each other. For somebody that's never been, it's not just people up reading from a book or soulless. There's music as well. Tell me about well, that. Well, first of all, uh, most of the poets know their stuff by heart, so they can put their soul into it. They don't, they're not tied to the written page. So it's not like a poetry reading, generally. I mean, sometimes that happens, but not that often. But there's a lot of music here. A lot of people writing songs, a lot of, I brought my band for the first time uh, this year. I'm an, I, my name tag says artist instead of organizer and that's what I've been angling towards for 32 years. Hal plays alongside Greg Iztok and Eli Rankle. Together, they form the Three Hat Trio. These cowboys taught me, you know, be bold, go out there and express yourself, be creative. and. Uh, so we've been writing songs. What we're doing is what we call American desert music. So it's very atmospheric. And, you know, when you start listening to us, you almost hear the mirages. Okay, so now going back, you're thinking, I'm gonna get a group together and we're gonna do this? Did you know that it would turn into this thing 32, 33 years later? <sighs> no clue. I mean, we thought we were doing a one-time event. You hit a nerve. What do you think yeah. that nerve or that need was that you were fulfilling? You know, I think in this, really flighty world, we need grounding. And this lifestyle, this poetry, this music, it's grounded in a certain way. It's born out of the environment, the life, the relationship with animals. It's, it's something that uh, is very powerful and underappreciated. I did not know Come my way. More than poetry, this festival tells a story. The story of cold winters and hardworking people. The story of a state that thrives under unforgiving conditions and takes pride in life's simplest things, just like a poem. And here we are today. Here we are today.
When you come here to Elko and you come to the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering, you learn real quick that this is much more than what it appears. It's not just about music and poetry and cowboys, but it's a gathering, a gathering of a very open and welcoming family whose main goal is to pass along tradition, history, and culture. And that's a great thing. Thank you.